SpaceX successfully launched two batches of Starlink satellites into orbit in less than 24 hours. On May 13, a SpaceX rocket carried 53 satellites for the Starlink Internet constellation into orbit after blasting off from Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. Less than nine minutes later, the Falcon 9's first stage came back to Earth for a pinpoint landing on the SpaceX drone ship. It was the fifth launch and landing for this particular booster. Following the launch, the Starlink satellites are deployed in an initial orbit below their operational altitude, ensuring that any satellites that fail to activate will re-enter the atmosphere quickly. Less than 24 hours after launching Starlink satellites from California, SpaceX lofted another 53 internet relay stations from Cape Canaveral aboard a brand new Falcon 9 rocket. After liftoff, the 70-meter tall rocket vectored its 7.6 meganewtons of thrust produced by nine Merlin engines to steer northeast over the Atlantic Ocean. After separating from the rocket's second stage, Falcon 9's brand new first stage booster, B1073, landed on a drone ship stationed approximately 600 kilometers downrange in the North Atlantic Ocean. About an hour after launch, the Starlink satellite separated from the upper stage into a near-circular orbit at an inclination of 53.2 degrees to the equator. After Saturday's mission, SpaceX has launched 2,600 Starlink satellites to date, and 2,321 of those satellites are in orbit and functioning as expected. Two more SpaceX missions are set to launch this month, with another Starlink mission and a transporter mission both set for the second half of May. California-based small rocket firm Astraspace disclosed details about its new launch vehicle capable of carrying heavier payloads to orbit. CEO Chris Kemp stated at the company's Space Tech Day event that the next-generation Rocket 4 launch vehicle would be capable of placing up to 300 kg into low-Earth orbit and 200 kg into sun-synchronous orbit for a base price of $3.95 million. On the other hand, Astra's current Rocket 3.3 vehicle can only carry a fraction of that payload, having launched only a few CubeSats at a time. While Rocket 3.3 employs five Astra Delphin engines with a total thrust of 155 kN, Rocket 4.0 employs two larger engines with a total thrust of 311 kN. Astra did not reveal technical details about the engines other than the fact that they use a turbopump rather than battery-powered pumps like the Delphin and run on liquid oxygen and kerosene. Astra is aiming for a higher flight rate with Rocket 4.0, with a test launch scheduled for the fourth quarter of this year. UK-based rocket firm, Orbital Express Launch Limited, or Orbex, has unveiled the first full-scale prototype of its prime orbital rocket. The 19-meter-long prime rocket is powered by renewable biopropane, which, according to Orbex, reduces the carbon footprint of each launch by more than 90 percent, compared to similar rockets that use fossil fuels. The two-stage rocket has seven 3D-printed engines, six on the first stage that propels it to an altitude of 80 kilometers, and one on the upper stage that places the payload into orbit. Over the past few months, the company has been conducting firing tests of its rocket engines. Prime will be able to carry small satellites weighing up to 200 kilograms to altitudes of up to 1,250 kilometers. With the first integration of a full-scale Orbex prototype launch vehicle on a launch pad now complete, the company will enter a period of integrated testing, allowing dress rehearsals of rocket launches and the development and optimization of launch procedures. This eco-friendly rocket will fly for the first time in a few months from Orbex's test and launch facility in Scotland. The international team of astronomers who produced the first direct image of a black hole three years ago have recently unveiled the first image of the supermassive black hole at the center of our Milky Way galaxy, known as Sagittarius A-star. Astronomers believe nearly all galaxies, including our own, have giant black holes at their center, where light and matter cannot escape, making it extremely hard to get images of them. The new image, taken in the light of submillimeter radio waves by the Event Horizon Telescope, provides the first direct visual evidence of the supermassive black hole 27,000 light-years away at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. As predicted by Einstein's theory of general relativity, the 4 million solar mass black hole's intense gravity is bending light and creating a shadow-like dark central region, surrounded by a bright ring-like structure. The Event Horizon Telescope, funded by the National Science Foundation, is a global network of radio telescopes which form a combined array with an angular resolution sufficient to observe objects the size of a supermassive black hole. In 2019, the Event Horizon Telescope made headlines when it succeeded in producing the first-ever image of the Event Horizon of a black hole, specifically the black hole at the center of the active elliptical galaxy, Messier 87. 
At the same time as it gathered the data that became that image, the telescope also performed observations of Sagittarius A star. However, producing an image of it proved more difficult than for Messier 87 star because of the giant cloud of ionized gas between Earth and the galactic center, which distorts the images the telescope takes. Seeing the difficulties, the Event Horizon team first focused on the M87 data before turning their full attention to that of Sagittarius A star. In the end, the researchers were able to produce their final image, which isn't just one picture, but the average of thousands of images created using different computational methods to account for the movement of the gas. The two black holes look remarkably similar, even though our galaxy's black hole is more than a thousand times smaller and less massive than M87 star. The two images can now be compared to gain valuable insight into the inner workings of these supermassive giants and how they interact with their surroundings. According to the research team, future observations will focus on getting sharper images to better understand the physics of turbulence in the ring around the black hole, as well as how the black hole affects the environment of the galaxy around it. China's Tianzhou-4 cargo spacecraft, carrying supplies for the upcoming Shenzhou-14 crewed mission, successfully docked with the Tianhou core module of the nation's under-construction Jiangong Space Station at 12.54 a.m. UTC on May 10. The docking occurred about seven hours after the cargo spacecraft lifted off atop a Long March 7 rocket from the Wenchang Satellite Launch Center in southern China's Hainan province. After around 10 minutes, Tianzhou-4 separated from the rocket and entered its designated orbit. The 13,500-kilogram Tianzhou-4 spacecraft is the sixth of 11 missions for the construction of the Chinese space station. The spacecraft delivered around 6,640 kilograms of supplies to the station. Like previous cargo flights, the Tianzhou-4 carried three categories of supplies, including six-month living supplies for Chinese astronauts, spare parts for space station maintenance, and space research equipment. The three-astronaut Shenzhou-14 is expected to head to the Tianhou core module in June on a Long March 2F rocket to start a six-month-long mission that will oversee the arrival of the second and third space station modules. The Wen-Tin module will dock with the Tianhou core module in July, and the Men-Tin module will dock with the core module in October to complete the in-orbit construction of the T-shaped outpost. Once completed, Jiangong Space Station will have a mass between 80 to 100 tons, roughly one-fifth the mass of the International Space Station. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. After undergoing repairs to address damage sustained during the first round of testing, SpaceX's upgraded Super Heavy prototype passed two cryogenic proof tests in quick succession. On May 9, Booster 7 plunged head-first into its first post-repair cryoproof test. Rather than testing the repaired booster methodically over a series of short tests, SpaceX immediately performed a full cryogenic proof and loaded the prototype to the brim with approximately 3,000 tons of liquid nitrogen. It took almost two hours to fill the tanks of the booster, which stand roughly 69 meters tall. Just two days later, on May 11, SpaceX put Booster 7 through a whole new cryogenic proof test. Once again, the booster was fully loaded with thousands of tons of cryogenic fluid before detanking an hour later. After fully detanking Booster 7, SpaceX replenished the oxygen tank of the booster with a few hundred tons of liquid nitrogen and remotely retracted and reconnected the booster's quick disconnect mechanism. The quick disconnect mechanism is mainly used to load propellant and supply electricity into the booster prior to an orbital flight. The launch pad umbilical is designed to retract after engine ignition to ensure that all hardware disconnects and pulls back from the rocket safely and reliably during liftoff. The test SpaceX conducted last Wednesday may have been a rough simulation of a post-ignition launch abort. To put it another way, SpaceX mimicked a scenario in which the quick disconnect mechanism had to reconnect with the booster if an orbital launch was aborted just before liftoff but after quick disconnect retraction. If the QD mechanism failed to reconnect to a fully fueled super heavy after a launch abort, simultaneous venting of gaseous methane and oxygen from the rocket would create an explosive environment around the launch pad. Having successfully completed two back-to-back post-repair cryoproof tests, SpaceX removed the booster from the orbital launch mount on May 13. The booster was returned to the build site the following day to complete the installation of Raptor version 2 engines, grid fins, aero covers, and engine heat shield. After completing all of these tasks, SpaceX will most likely begin the static fire test campaign. Booster 7's companion, Starship 24, is currently stationed inside the high bay. 
Ship 24, which is believed to have been assigned to the orbital launch debut, was fully stacked on May 8. If you take a close look at Ship 24, you can clearly see an odd-looking hatch on its side. The hatch serves as a satellite dispenser door through which satellites will be deployed into orbit. A payload dispenser prototype is already installed inside the nose cone barrel section of Ship 24. A lot of work remains to be done on Ship 24, including Raptor installation, aft flaps and aero cover installation, internal and external plumbings, and some finishing touches on the thermal protection tiles. Ship 24's aft flap and Raptor engines will be installed in the coming days. As part of the engine development, SpaceX is rapidly testing Falcon 9 Merlin engines and Starship Raptor engines at its test facility in McGregor, Texas. Tests for the Raptor version 2 engines, which is the latest generation of the Raptor engines, kicked off in December, and since then SpaceX has been rapidly firing the engines. Video footage acquired from NASA Space Flight's live video feed shows us that the most recent tests conducted on May 9 and 10 ended up in a mishap. The test stand's water suppression system spewed water as the engine ignited on the stand on May 9. Four seconds after ignition, flames erupted from the test stand, the engine shut down, and clouds of smoke began to billow from the test stand. These clouds are unusual, having not been present in previous successful Raptor tests at the same stand. The clouds of smoke indicate that the engine suffered failure just after ignition. A visually similar mishap occurred the next day, on May 10, resulting in the loss of another Raptor V2 engine. Failures on test stands are extremely rare for the Raptor version 2 engines, which have been at the center of rapid testing for months. The previous major failure occurred on January 27, when a test caused the engine's internal components to melt and emit green flames. With the second-generation Raptor engines, SpaceX is aiming to achieve more than 230 tons of thrust to mark a significant increase over the first-generation engines. As a result, SpaceX pushes the engines to their limits, resulting in occasional failures like this. Last week, at Starbase, SpaceX relocated two old Starship prototypes to new sites. Starship 16, which had been standing in the rocket garden for several months, was the first prototype to be relocated. On May 10, Ship 16 was moved into the new Mega Bay. The prototype was then used to test the load carrying capacity of the bridge crane installed inside the Mega Bay. The crane will be used to stack future super heavy prototypes once it has been proven to be capable of lifting heavy loads without failure. Ship 16's nose cone was later separated from the rest of the vehicle, indicating that it would most likely be scrapped. Starship 20 was the next prototype to be relocated to a new site. It was once thought that the prototype would be launched into orbit atop Super Heavy Booster 4. Ship 20 is now resting on a display stand in the Rocket Garden, where Ship 16 previously stood. Roofing works of the Mega Bay are progressing at the construction site, and it appears that SpaceX is planning to set up a mission control room on top of the building. During a recent interview with the Financial Times, Elon Musk provided the updated Starship orbital launch and Mars mission timelines. We're making a lot of progress with Starship. We will hopefully have our first uh, launch attempt uh, this summer, um, or basically next next two or three months. Uh, I don't know, maybe get Starship to Mars uh, uncrewed in um, three to five years. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.